love family and help you understand that family is a work in progress through videos so consider to subscribe to my channel and also like my facebook and um, youtube as well today is an amazing day it's a day that i've actually been looking forward to to do something with men's health and i'm going to be telling you why i've decided to do this so exactly two years ago i lost my big brother and from two weeks ago i also um heard what happened on the news which we lost um chadwick which was one of our great actors black actors and that reminded me of my big brother because he's also meant to be 43 this year so thinking about it it made me think is that something i should have done or something that my brother should have done to keep him up to now and it got me thinking and i decided to come up with this whole thing because i know my brother died at his prime and i wouldn't want to wish anyone something like that so this topic and this talk show is coming from a place of, of love and coming from a place of someone that have lo uh, lost a loved one so don't think that it's something that is just coming from a woman wants to talk about it it's coming from a deep place in my heart so today we're going to be talking about men's health and the, not just men's health physical health mental health and also we're going to be talking about men's well-being how to help them be proactively looking after themselves so based on that, I've got someone who is going to be coming to talk to us about men's health. And I'm just going to be reading his introduction and to let you understand the caliber of person that is coming. So we we'll have our guest, Dr. Hector Goma. He's a general practitioner involved in the provision of health and services through planned and unplanned consultation with special interest in cardiovascular risk management and lifestyle intervention, patient safety, mobile technology in health. And this one is so important. He is also helping people to take responsible, uh, responsible of their well-being and tackling broad determinants of health. Dr. Hector Goma is a clinical director in a primary care network in Leeds and in the UK, a lead GP, hmm, a lead GP who owns his own practice in Leeds. He holds various leadership positions and heads an organization which provides loans and scholarship to entrepreneurs and less privileged. This is just a summary of who our guest is. So without further ado, I'm going to bring Dr. Abiye Hector Goma to join me. Hello, sir. Good evening, sir. Hi, good evening. Good to see you. Good to see you. How are you, sir? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so, so much for agreeing to come on my talk show. Thank you so, so, so much. I appreciate you, sir. It's a privilege. Thanks. So we have a lot to cover, and I'm sure that people are ready to um, be with us today. So if you're live with us, please let me know in the comment section what, um, if you can hear me clearly, so I can also say hello to you because I want everyone to get what we're going to be saying. So if you can hear me, let me know in the comment section that you can hear me and that everything is fine. Paulinus Obi Nam. Um, I can't understand, my dear. I don't understand what you mean. If you can clarify with me, that would be amazing. If you can just um, clarify what you mean, that would be amazing. But we're just going to start. Yes, we're just going to start straight away because we have a lot to cover. And Dr. Hetogoma is ready to answer a lot of questions. So if you have any questions, if you have anything while we are talking, please just send it on the comment section. And if you're joining us, please share the video on Facebook, share the video on um, your WhatsApp group, let people come on, let men come, let women come as well. We want everyone to be on board so we can just go on as soon 
as possible. So, sir, we're going to start with the first question, which we're going to be covering physical health. My first question is, what are the common health challenge men have? The common ones. Right. Um, if you don't mind, I would like to look answer the question from a broad um, perspective. Yeah. Um, if you look at the ages, if you look at the ages from, from the point of decades, so you have the 10 to 19 year old, that's when you get the adolescent, then 20 to 29, 30 to 39, if you look at it from a decades point of view. Mm -hmm. So the problems of the man who is just turned 19, the teenager, you know, there are some problems. But if you look at the man who is a working class man, the adult man, the common problems could be looked at from a physical point of view, mental, social, cultural. So from a physical point of view, the common problems of the 40-year or 50-year-old man are usually cardiovascular problems, mm. things like diabetes, hypertension, um, kidney disease, heart disease. Those are the commoner problems, the, the modern problems of lifestyle lifestyle related problems that they are the commoner problems. If you look at the teenager to young adult, things that have to do with physical things like work related, like suicide, mm. um, things like injuries from accidents are common with the young adults. So you have injuries, suicide, mental health issues, death problems, relationship problems. From a physical point of view, cardiovascular problems are the commonest ones. So mm -hmm. diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, kidney disease, maybe even cancers in the older man. Then things like dementia in the retired people, those who are senior citizens, worry about dementia. So again, and then prostate problems are also commoner in the much older men. So physical problems, mental problems, these are the commonest ones. Wow. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. I'm just going to come back to... So in but Dr. Hector, I just like basically um, summarized the problem. But now we're going to go like in a little bit um, specific. So we're going to talk about prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is one of the killers of men. I'm a bit um, a private because I work in, I'm a biomedical scientist by profession, and I work in histopathology. So okay. I have an idea what I've seen a lot of things. So prostate cancer is, is a slow killer, basically. And most men don't know about it. So I would like you, sir, to shed more light on prostate cancer and the symptoms based on just prostate cancer that men should not ignore as soon as they they start experiencing them. Okay, right. I mean, I would like to look at most conditions from three points of view. Uh, there are four things that affect people's health all over the world. Mm. The first is your, the genes they are born with. So, for example, if a man's father had prostate cancer and his grandfather had prostate cancer, there's every chance that he too would have prostate cancer. So the first thing that affects our health in every area is life's um, genes. You cannot change your genes. I always use the example, choose your parents carefully. Hmm. Nobody can choose their parents. So because you can't choose your parents, your genes you're born with, you cannot change your genes. But many times abnormalities in the genes express themselves when there's an interaction with the environment. Somebody can be born with a gene that may affect him to have prostate cancer, but how he lives his life will not make a difference between actually having that gene and that gene expressing itself in the form of prostate cancer. So the first thing is one's genes. You yeah. can't do much about that. The next thing is your lifestyle. Almost every disease condition has the same lifestyle issues about physical activity, diet, whether you smoke or you don't smoke, whether you exercise, whether you sleep well, whether you're a happy person or you're a sad person. The lifestyle issues are virtually almost the same for all physical conditions. And then your attitude to your health. You know, the, the man is seen as a macho person. So most men, when you look at the statistics on health, the problems that we have as men is that we are expected by society or by ourselves to be macho. A man who is macho does not go to see his doctors. Mm. That's for the woman and the children to go to. So when men have symptoms, we tend to ignore those symptoms. So the first thing then is the lifestyle, the, um, the genes, the lifestyle, and then the kind of health services we have. Talking about health services, 
screening helps to identify cancers long before they can cause major issues. Prostate cancer does not have a good screening tool. All we have currently is the PSA, the process specific antigen. A good screening tool, when it says it is positive, it is positive. If it says it's negative, it is negative. But there's a lot of false positive and a lot of false negative. So the PSA test is actually very good for monitoring cancer, but it's not use, really that useful for identifying when somebody has prostate cancer. But having said that, that is all we have for now. So the most important thing for all men to know are the symptoms which can suggest prostate cancer. Now, if you have a pen, just write down IPSS. Mm. IPSS stands for International Prostate Symptom Score. You can Google it and check it out online. There are seven main symptoms which could suggest something to do with the prostate. It's not specific for prostate cancer, but that is your best step at home. The Several symptoms are incomplete emptying is one, mm. frequency. Incomplete emptying simply means you go and we, when you go back and see that you feel that your bladder is not really empty, that's incomplete emptying. The next one is frequency. You go and we, and then in less than two hours, you feel like going to we again. For those men who drink beer or alcohol on a cold day, if you're in the bar with your friends drinking, when you've had a bottle of beer, you find that you go and we, Barely an hour later, you want to go back and wee. So frequency is the need to go and wee less than two hours after the last time. Then the third one is called intermittency, where you wee and then it's as if you're starting and stopping. It doesn't just flow at once. The fourth one is urgency. I'm talking to you now. Imagine I have to get up and dash to go and wee. Mm. The urge to wee, you can't hold the urine. And then the next one is weak stream. You have to move very close to the to the toilet so you don't wee on yourself or on the floor. And then the last two are straining, where you have to struggle for the, as if there's a blockage, you have to struggle to wee. And then the final one is waking up several times in the night. These are the seven symptoms that will suggest prostate. Now, it could be due to other things, but if you have those seven symptoms or one or two of them, then it means you should go and see your doctors and then your doctors can examine you and then talk with you about doing a PSA test. So these are the seven key symptoms. IPSS, Google it, check the seven symptoms. If you have them, go and get checked. Wow. Honestly, this is so, like, it's so packed because sometimes, so how can you differentiate these symptoms and um, when you have kidney infection or water infection? Because some they all present similar symptoms. I guess exactly. it's still going to the yes, hospital. Yes, that's, that's the point. So the yeah. thing is that if you have any of these symptoms and you come and see me, for example, mm -hmm. I'll f check your abdomen. If, for example, you have pain when I press the back of your as, on your back, that may suggest kidney infection. Of course, one of the things we do is to feel your lower tummy and then maybe check your prostate, which involves putting one of your, uh, a finger into your back passage and then checking your prostate. Now, if I checked your prostate, it is, if it is big or you feel pain when I do that, maybe you have prostatitis, which is an infection of the prostate. I'll, I'll check your urine. If I find white cells and maybe blood or protein or nitrite, that may mean that you have an infection. And then sometimes the seven, the seven symptoms some suggest what we call overactive bladder. Some people have overactive bladder, mm -hmm. which is a different problem. Some of the symptoms suggest obstruction. Now, the obstruction can be because your prostate is enlarged. doesn't mean you have cancer. And that's when we now start the investigation. There's, if the symptoms and then the urine check suggests infection, we check, we treat for infection. And if after the infection is treated, everything comes back to normal, that suggests that all you had was infection. If you take a lot of caffeine and you're weaning all the time, maybe cutting back on caffeine and things get better, you're fine. If you're stressed, you could have overactive bladder. If you manage stress and things get better, you know it's because of that. So we'll be in a position to rule out the different causes, but we can't do any of that until you come and present yourself for checks. Wow. Guys, please, if you're watching this and you have not shared, you're just getting all this information yourself. And people are not going to get this information. The best thing or the 
the, the, the biggest thing you can do for me now is to share this video. Share it on Facebook. It's already on Facebook anyway, but if you're watching on Facebook, share it on your Facebook page. If you're on YouTube, share it from YouTube to your WhatsApp. Honestly, share, share, share. That is the biggest thing you can do now. Share, share, share. So thank you so much for the first um, question you've answered. We're going to move on to the next one, which is high blood pressure. So the same thing you've just done with prostate cancer, high blood pressure. What are the symptoms or the signs that men should be looking out for that they should not ignore? The most important message for high blood pressure for everybody who is listening to us, watching us, is that hypertension is a silent killer. Mm. If you don't remember anything else about hypertension or high blood pressure, it is a silent killer. If you have diarrhea, nobody needs to tell you you have diarrhea because you'll be walking in and out of the toilet. If you have an infection on your thumb, mistakenly put your hand to get your car keys from your pocket, you will, for, you will, not, you will not forget, forgive yourself, you have an infection. Mm. With hypertension, you can be perfectly normal. Are you sorry to, I need to tell you this story. I had a 35 year old chap who came to me to sign a, a piece of paper. I was going to Paris for Paris Marathon, he did not triathlon. He was a very fit 35 year old. And I just said, let me check his blood pressure. It was 210 over 120, mm. something ridiculous. This was Friday. It was a travel Saturday morning. I said, you're not going anywhere. And he was asking me if I'm joking. So this is a perfectly fit 35 year old whose blood pressure was almost going to cause a volcanic eruption, but he felt fit. So the only way you know you have hypertension is to check your blood pressure. Mm. If you have never checked your blood pressure, if you've been over a year, check your blood pressure. That's the only way you may know. So first thing is that it's a silent killer. You could be perfectly fine now, the next minute you cannot raise your hand because you've had a stroke. So most people do not have any symptoms of hypertension. But going back to the four issues are the same, your genes, if your father, mother, grandfather had hypertension, maybe you will also have. So your genes are number one. Your lifestyle is the same thing. For us who are people of African descent, salt is a key risk factor. Too much salt in the diet will make you have high blood pressure at an earlier age. Stress, overeating of fatty, sugary, salty foods, little exercise, these are the same risk factors for any condition. So lifestyle, physical activity or its lack thereof, diet, then whether you smoke or you don't smoke, whether you drink or you don't drink, your work-life balance, how much sleep you have, the same lifestyle issues are the things that are the risk factors for hypertension. So the only way you will know whether your blood pressure is high or not is to have it checked. So would you recommend that every family should have high blood pressure, the machine, the, the thing to check it at home? It should be, should well, be one of the recommended things to have at home as your first aid kit. Well, I wouldn't really say if you, if, you, if you have been diagnosed with hypertension, then you should have a monitor because it's important that blood pressure, when it's being monitored, blood pressure at home may be lower than blood pressure at your doctor's because if you, are, if you go to a place where you struggle to find somewhere to park, if you go there, a doctor is running late and you have somewhere to go, you get a bit irritated. All those things can make your blood pressure go up a bit more. But if you check your blood pressure at home, get the numbers written down, then you go to the doctors. The doctor checks your blood pressure and it's higher than what you have at home. He or she will rely on the home reading, which is a more normal one. So for monitoring, if you already have hypertension, it's good to have your own monitor. But if you're not hypertensive, you don't need to buy a machine. You can just go and use, if you go to the doctors, every, at least in the UK, every GP practice has a blood pressure monitor. You can just go and check your blood. You don't need a doctor's appointment. Maybe after this COVID period, when life comes back to normal, you can walk into your doctor's surgery and check your blood pressure anytime. If you go to the pharmacy, most pharmacies have blood pressure machines, you can just have your blood pressure checked. But if you're not hypertensive, at least once a year, try and have your blood pressure checked. So is it possible, because I've heard from some people, 
Is it possible mm. that you can you can be diagnosed with high blood pressure and it goes? Is it possible for high blood pressure to go? Is that true or is something that it's is it's there for not impo it's not impossible. It is, but this is the exception rather than the rule. For example, women can have pregnancy induced hypertension. Mm -hmm. After they've had a baby, the blood pressure comes down. If a man is working in a very stressful, terribly stressful place, he could have hypertension. If he changes his work or retires, the blood pressure can come down. So that is the exception. It's not impossible that blood pressure can come down. But I would what we do is that we, we treat people based on their blood pressure reading. So if blood pressure becomes low and becomes too low, we stop the blood pressure tablets. But they can still be hypertensive. So we say every month or every three months, continue to check your blood pressure because it could come down because the person has too many tablets. If you now stop the tablets, it can bounce back up. So it's not impossible, but it's a rare thing for blood pressure. It's like it's a lifelong con. So we manage hypertension. We don't cure it. A few people have 5% of their um, hypertensives have an obvious cause. 95% there is no obvious cause. Mm. And for the 5%, if you're able to remove the cause like hypertension, sorry, like um, pregnancy and other things, yes, but for 95% of people, it's a lifelong condition that you manage. Wow. Honestly. Thank you so much. So moving on to the next one, which is, I guess, linked to high, high blood pressure. We're going to talk about heart failure and heart attack in mm. men. So, okay. Can we talk about that as well, please? Right. Okay. What I want us to to picture is that um, let's take a balloon for example. Mm. When you blow a balloon, you put air into the balloon, and then the balloon gets bigger. Let's imagine that. So what happens is that even though the heart contains all the blood that is being pumped, the heart itself does not get the blood supply to its muscles when the blood is inside the heart. The blood comes out of the heart into the aorta, and as the aorta is rising, then the coronary arteries now branch off the aorta, and they now supply blood to the muscles of the heart. Now, you won't believe that the coronary arteries are only about two to three uh, millimeters in size, mm. something like that. So what happens is that when our lifestyle is not right, and our cholesterol levels begin to rise, or our sugar levels begin to rise. Let me just say this. Excess sugar inflames the walls of the blood vessels. The human body sends cholesterol to the inflamed walls of the blood vessels to try and repair the inflammation, but does a bad job, and then the cholesterol deposits in the walls. With time, the walls become narrow. When we do exercise, the body, the muscles of the blood vessels relax so that blood can flow freely into the muscles that will need more oxygen and glucose. Now, as we grow older and plaques form in the blood vessel walls, it becomes more difficult for these blood vessels to expand in time of exercise, in times of fright when more oxygen and glucose is required and this is what leads to heart attack something makes your body demand more oxygen and glucose the ability to open up is like let's imagine there is a stampede in a hall where people are watching a film if all the doors are wide open people can run out easily but if there's there are 10 doors and only one door is slightly open there's going to be a stampede people people are going to get hurt. So in heart attack, what happens is the blood vessels, the coronary arteries are not able to open up for blood to flow freely for oxygen and glucose and the muscles die. I know you, there's something you have be interested in. Men go and have sex, they over try to impress their partners mm. or their babes and then the man who doesn't do any exercise normally sits mm. out to watching TV, mm. suddenly now wants to overwork his heart. And what happens? The heart is not able to cope. And then you have a heart attack and people drop dead in their hotel rooms for the same principle. So again, it comes back. Won't stop the blood vessels from being inflamed. 
by cutting back on sugar, mind the junk food you eat to reduce cholesterol, and then do regular exercise. So you don't just wake up one day and run a marathon when you've been sitting. Nobody runs a marathon overnight. You pick up from walking, walking, jogging, running, one meter, one mile, then you go and do a marathon. But some people want to have marathon sex one night and then they end up six feet below. And that's the reason why people from hypertension, from heart disease now progress to having a heart attack. Wow. Someone just asked a question on YouTube. The person said, um, Doctor, if your parents have stroke, does it mean that you are likely going to have stroke? I'm sure you've met, you said something about it. Yeah, I said something like yeah. that. Yes. I mean, the answer is yes and no. They say the wise man learns from other people's experience. If your parent has stroke, maybe they never knew they were hypertensive. Mm. But now you know that you need to check your blood pressure. If you check your blood pressure, your blood pressure is high, you go on medication and you take your medication regularly, not because you have a headache or your eyes twitching, but you understand today that most people that have hypertension have zero symptoms. Mm. The first symptom of hypertension may be a stroke and that would be too late. So because your blood pressure is high, you take your medicines, you change your lifestyle. If you're overweight, you learn to lose weight, cut back on salt, cut back on, on shawarma and all those nice foods which are destroying your health. So when your lifestyle changes, you're more active and your blood pressure is controlled, you live a healthier, happier life, you're probably never going to have the stroke that your parents had because you've learned the lesson from them and you've changed your lifestyle and then you're, you're compliant with your medication if you're hypertensive. Wow. So basically, if whatever you've, you saw your parents suffering from, it's something that should give you um, like a heads up to know that, look, my parents suffered from this, so there is a chance that I may suffer from this. So it gives you time to actually start working on get, having a better um, lifestyle, your food, your exercise, and everything that you need to do. They say knowledge is power. When you know that you're likely going to suffer from something, it's better you actually do something about it. It's worse that you don't know and it happens. Exactly. So now that you yes. know, do something about it. That's the most important thing. Thank you so much, sir, for that. We're going to go on to diabetes, right? Mm. It's all linked up, I know. What can you say are the symptoms or the signs that people shouldn't ignore? that they have uh, and with that with with those signs they may not know that they have diabetes but mm. when they have those signs they should know that there's something wrong they should have they have to go and see the doctor as soon as well so what are those signs that men should not ignore and women as well when they see mm. their partners having these signs they should not ignore it as well okay now diabetes it's is both sexes so and the good thing again about diabetes is that it's not enough if for example one member of the family has a, a disease condition you now have appetite in the house as mm. it were say you you have hypertension so you are going to have less salt in your food they now cook a different pot of soup with less salt and a normal pot of soup with more salt that puts the person but if everybody in the family now reduces the salt oh. in the food they take then that way you're postponing the likelihood of your child becoming hyper mm. you're not stopping the salt but you're even if a 50 percent reduction so coming back to diabetes i mentioned something ipss the next thing I'd like everybody to write down is Q diabetes, Q as in Q, queen, so Q diabetes. If you Google Q diabetes, it would, you take you to a website where you can see the risk factors for diabetes. I'll try and mention some of them. One is your age. As I say, the older you go, the cooler it becomes. <laughs> Apart from those who have type 1 diabetes, which can be childhood, most type 2 diabetics are older. So the older you are, the 20-year-old person is not, who is not, does not have type 1 diabetes is unlikely to have type 2 diabetes. But a 40 or 50-year-old person is more likely to. So one is your age. Two is your ethnicity. In, in the UK, for example, people from the Asian subcontinent, people from, of African descent are more likely to have diabetes than people who are um uh, Caucasians. Now there are other reasons because the, the, the research is truth is that you take on the diseases of the countries where you live. Mm. I've been in the UK for 25 years. I'm not going to have malaria even though I grew up in Nigeria because I'm in the UK. So the conditions that you have 
are the same as the conditions in, in the country where you live. So diabetes is a big issue. So your age, your ethnicity, the third one is your body mass index. If you, uh, if you can hold your sides, your, your abdomen and hold your side, there's a chunk of flesh, that if you can grab a chunk of flesh, that means that you have a risk of diabetes. But if you cannot find any flesh to hold, that means your risk of diabetes is reduced. I use the example that as a man or a woman, if you're in the bathroom, put a coin between your toes, between your big toes and stand. If you can see the coin, it means your tummy is flat. If you cannot see the coin, you're in big trouble. So if you cannot see the coin, if you can grab a, a, a abdominal fold, it means your, your risk for diabetes is high. If you run or jog 30 minutes every day, that means that your risk is reduced. But if you know in the last week, you've not as much as walked beyond the car, your risk is high. So physical inactivity, being overweight, being of African or Caribbean or Asian origin, being 40 years or over, these are key risk factors. And if you have a family history of diabetes, this, if you have any of these, particularly if you're up to 40, make sure you've gone to check your blood sugar levels wherever you live. In the UK, if you're 40 and over, you are entitled to free NHS health check. If you're 45, you are entitled to another NHS. Every five years, it is paid for by your taxes. Mm. Go and have your health check. If you're paying taxes, you've not had a health check, you're wasting your money, and one day your family could lose you. So go and do a health check. It's your right. So these are the key risk factors for diabetes. Symptom-wise, the commonest symptoms we know about is you find if you find yourself needing to drink water, you're thirsty all the time, or you're weeing more, it's, a, it's almost a, a little too late. It's better to be diagnosed before you have those symptoms. And that's the beauty of health checks. Don't wait until you're thirsty all the time. You start going to pay water rate, as they say, all the time. <laughs> you're losing weight. You have thrush every now and then. You feel f tired. You're listless. Those are the key symptoms of diabetes. If you have them, it means that you've not used the opportunity that God has given you. But that's the kind of thing that you need to do. Those are the common symptoms of diabetes. Talking about those living in the UK, I, I was just thinking about it, sir, what you just said. People, pay, people that live in the UK that are still applying for visa, they pay for NHS surcharge. And mm. it's increasing every year. It's increasing every year. You, you'll be amazed how much it was like last year and how much it is this year. Even with the whole COVID-19, the fact that people are not going out to do the biometric, people are staying at home to do everything. They don't really need that amount of money. But they are still increasing that surcharge. And there are people that have been paying that NHS surcharge for five, six years, and they've never visited their GP. Like the doctor said, you're just, you're just giving offering. You're just, you're just dashing <laughs> money. You're just dashing money to the system. You're not using it. And there are people as well that they have, they've been receiving letters to go for their normal checkup. They've not been going. As a woman, and from a woman's perspective, please, we are begging you, go for your appointment. You pay for NHS surcharge, use it. You're in Nigeria or any part of the world, you have uh, at least primary care. Try and go. Because the money, I always say to myself, the money that they will use for phone error, you can as well use it to keep yourself alive instead of using it for phone error. So moving on, sir, we're going to talk about male infertility. I heard of a story of a lady that um, met a guy, an older lady that met a guy, and this guy has been married for years. And obviously his wife has gotten to the age where she can't have children anymore. So the wife said to him, go and find another person. So fortunately, he met this lady that I know. And the lady, I would say with wisdom, decided to, okay, you couldn't have kids with your wife. All he said was, my wife couldn't have kids for me. My wife couldn't have kids for me. So they decided to go and do like a test. He, she said, before I get married to you, I'm going to do, we want us to do a medical test. And they found out that it was the man that had the problem. So this other woman has wasted the whole of her life thinking she was the problem, probably going from one native to another native, drinking all the things, drinking and she only just discovered that she can't have kids, not because she can't, 
but because the man did not check himself or it was the man's fault. So, sir, please, hammer on male infertility. What do you have to say? What are the symptoms that men should not ignore in terms of male okay. infertility? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I want to do is whoever this lady is, I want to congratulate her for her fidelity to the man that she she was married to. And she's not wasted her life. Hopefully, they had a good time together. But having said that, um, I remember when I was a medical student, uh, my, when we had a lecture on fertility, my consultant said that a woman is pregnant simply means as a fertile man in town. You know, that's the, that's the way he said it. Fertility is a problem of one-thirds. One-third of the time, there's something wrong with the woman. One-third of the time, there's something wrong with the man. And one-third of the time, there's no problem. It's just that it hasn't happened. And that's it's a, it's a question of thirds. So the male factors, one is the same thing that happens is blockage of the tubes. The tubes take sperms from the testes to the penis at ejaculation. If a man has had chlamydia infections, gonorrhea infections, he was enjoying his life as a young man, he may have had infections, and those infections may have blocked his tubes. So it's possible that a man, that's why one of the things they do in fertility testing is to do chlamydia antibodies and antigen tests to see if a man has chlamydia. So somebody has, could have had infections would have blocked his tubes. Next one is the issue of testosterone. Some people have problems with the hormones and their testosterone levels may be reduced. It's interesting to note that low vitamin D has been seen to be a contributing factor for both men and women with infertility. So one of the things that we also do is to check the vitamin D levels to be sure that both the men and the women have enough vitamin D in their system. Then there are also the lifestyle issues about exercise. Being overweight is a risk factor for infertility. On the NHS particularly, a woman's body mass must be less than 30 before she gets NHS funded treatment. So if you are again, if your body mass is high, you have to do your best to cut your weight down by being more active, improving your diet. And diet is always reduce salt, reduce sugar, reduce fat, more vegetables, more fruits have vitamin D supplements. Some men have been taking anabolic steroids to try and look macho and to try and look good. Anabolic steroids destroy sperm production. Mm -hmm. So if you're a young man who have been doing bodybuilding, please stop anabolic steroids. So these are the common risk factors. If you do smoke, smoking stops sperm production. You have to stop smoking. Then the issue about sex, some people always thought you should have sex around when the woman is ovulating. That was yesterday's um, advice. Now is have sex throughout the month. Mm. There are about seven days when a woman is most likely to get pregnant. But don't just wait for the day of ovulation. From ovulation, a woman has, I think, about 18% chance on the day of ovulation and then 10% chance on the day after ovulation. The rest of the chances of getting pregnant take place the six days, five to six days before then. But the advice is have sex, apart from the menstrual period, try and have sex throughout the month, as against trying to target one day to have sex. So the final point is, is about two becoming one. You know, the happier and the more connected a man and a woman are, I guess even the chances of getting pregnant are more. But these are the key things, stop smoking, stop drinking alcohol in moderation, exercise, weight reduction, enough vitamin D, and those are the key things. And they're having sex throughout the month and not just once a month on the day of ovulation. And then, like I said, one third of the time, there is no problem. So just do your best to just carry on life as well as you can be. And for those who have faith, I believe as, you know, one of people try to disregard spiritual aspect of health. We have physical, social, cultural, psychological, mental, spiritual health is important. You know, like we say, children are a blessing from God. Mm -hmm. So when you've done all those things, having the belief that in, in his time, he makes all things beautiful is something that is also is important for those who are believing God for children. Wow. So do you think, is there any... Um Thing linked to hereditary when it comes to um, male infertility or genetics? Is that anything? Well, oh, definitely. Like everything has to do with your genes. 
Some men are said to be firing blank shots. Some men have a condition called azuspermia, which means that their cells, the sperm cells, are not working at all. And some are born with that. If somebody, you know, when, a, when men are usually reluctant to do sperm analysis, but if a man does sperm count and he comes back with zero sperm, that is zero sperm. So that man's wife can only get pregnant through donation of sperm because it means that he has come into this world with the sperm cells not working. Now, it's not impossible that that could be a genetic thing. So it's not impossible that, yes, somebody could have zero sperm, which is genetic. So is, it, is there um, a solution? Is there a remedy to low sperm count or male infertility? Well, definitely. I mean, like we said, it, you only need one sperm to get a woman pregnant. A man has between 10 and 400 million sperm, so that is a real wasteful exercise. You just need one sperm, mm. and a man produces millions of sperm. So really, he just needs one sperm. So when a man, if the problem of infertility is due to low sperm count, the fertility experts can look at the, the sperm analysis result. It might be that the man has, let us say, 100 million sperms, only about 100 are normal. So they can actually harvest a normal sperm, and instead of the sperm going from the vagina all the way to the fallopian tube, that's almost like a man swimming across the Atlantic Ocean, mm. the, the strategy experts can take the egg, make the journey shorter for the healthiest looking sperm. That can be done. So yes, but if it is a zero sperm count, then there has to be a donor sperm, or they have to look at options of adoption. Because the truth is that many, many, many people have been adopted. So if all is not going to work, having your own child as an adopted child is another option. But yes, if a man has low count, the specialty experts can harvest the healthiest looking sperms and get them to have a shorter journey to fertilize the eggs. Yeah. So thank you so much. Guys, if you're watching and you, you're watching from Facebook, thank you. I just want to say thank you for watching from Facebook. Thank you, those of you on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube and you've not subscribed to this channel, you're going to be doing yourself, I don't know, because there will be more topics like this. We are hoping that doctor is going to come back to talk more on men's health and every other thing. So you're going to miss out on so many other topics and talk shows. So please press the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. And if you like what doctor is saying, no, you have to like it because I don't know why you will not like it. But you have to press the like button as well. If you have any question as he's talking, I'm going to take on any question. So as soon as he comes, I'm going to take it on. So put it on the comment section. If you have any view, you have any opinion, put it on the comment section. If you have any myth, anything that you think, okay, my father told me, doctor is saying a different thing, put it on the comment section and he's going to address everything. So moving on, still on the infertility matter. What are other options? I know you've mentioned a few. What are other options that men that are struggling to have kids? What, what are the options that you can actually uh, try? Because obviously you've mentioned uh, something like um, artificial insemination or IVF, however, I don't know, is the one you said. And you've also mentioned adoption. What other options that men have that they can actually explore? Okay, I mean, the, 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 like I said, the, when you've done the lifestyle things, the next thing will definitely be to see your doctors because there is a whole range of tests mm. which can be done. I mean, again, using the UK example, we have a list of tests that the fertility team expects us to do. It makes life easier. So we, in general practice, do all those tests. And once we've got the results, we now send those treat the things that we can treat and then send it to the fertility team. They will now look at the factors and then do what they need to do. You know, so the key thing is for the man is a sperm. If the sperm count is zero, they will just tell them you need to get artificial insemination. If the sperm count is low and you've done it twice, it's still low, then it'll be a question of artificial insemination. And then having done that, it's either if the man and the woman say we're going to live without a child or we just keep trying. There are people who have gone to, I uh, know a friend who had failed IVF, but it's as if the failed IVF opened the, opened, the, opened the gates because the year after I failed IVF, she had um, a normal child, two years after she had twins, naturally. So again, one third of the times, it's just not happened. But I mean, it's either 
um, lifestyle modification, time, IVF, or adoption. Or you just decide that you'll be fine. We just either take a family, a relative's child, or we just be by ourselves. Do you have any view on um, what is the other one that someone can carry the baby for you? What is it called now? Um, surrogate. Surrogate. Do you have any view mm. on that as, as a doctor? Um, I mean, they're, they're, as a doctor, I want to do the best for my patients. So that option is there in places. And if you have a woman who is willing to be a surrogate mother, and as long as she's had a psychological counseling, because it's not an easy decision to make, and if she's very certain that she's happy to get go on with that, then that's fine as an option. So um, whether it is the, the woman's egg or the man's sperm or whatever it is, as long as the surrogate mother as well as the couple have that satisfaction within themselves and they've had proper support, they've not been pressured into doing it, they've looked at the pros and cons and they've come to a decision, then that's fine if that's what they want. So like I said, I'm not to pontificate for them. If that's what, if, if that's the option that they find workable for them and they find the surrogate mother, that's fine. So would you recommend, as from a doctor's perspective as well, um, like, because for women, most women take, like, where women take some multivitamins to help them when it comes to fertility. So I remember when I was getting, trying to get pregnant, I started taking some medication prior to when I started trying. These are just over the counter, not, mm. not the ones. So do, is there anything that men can be taking as well that is just over the counter? It's not like prescription medication. Okay, yes. Yeah, similar. I mean, every woman, like you said, should have three, should take folic acid once she wants to get pregnant. Every woman should take over the counter 400 micrograms of folic acid. If she has some other conditions, then our doctors should prescribe the higher dose 5 milligrams. Vitamin D supplement is what has been suggested that everybody, woman and man, should have sufficient vitamin D levels. In fact, they actually say people wanting to get, women trying to get pregnant should have a higher level of vitamin D. Normal level is 75 to 210 or so. So a woman wanting to get pregnant should not be going for 75 to 80. She can get up to 150, 160, higher part of normal. That's fine. So likewise, men are encouraged to have vitamin D supplements. But of course, the most important things are stopping smoking, minimize or stop alcohol, a good healthy lifestyle, being active are the key things. Vitamin C, I mean, vitamin supplements, as long as they are not high doses, you have nothing to lose. Your body will absorb what it needs and you'll pass out what you don't need. So, but particularly vitamin D, folic acid and vitamin C, those are the key vitamins that are advised, not any other vitamin things. Okay. Thank mm. you so much. Someone just asked on um, on Facebook, um, said, can you, can the doctor kindly talk on prostate? I think the person just came on now. That was the first thing, the very first thing we talked about. So I would advise you to, after the, the live stream, to go back from the beginning and watch um, what the doctor said. We've covered um, prostate cancer and it would be nice for us to move on to other things. Mm. So moving on, sir. What would you advise men over 40, 50, 60? What would you advise them to, to be doing to maintain a healthy and a healthy physical um, and lifestyle? What is your advice as a, as a GP? Okay, I mean, again, depending on which part of the world they are in, if they are in the UK, there are health checks which are programmed for men and also for women at various times. Um, the age 40 health check we talked about, the age 40 health check is good because we check your glucose level that will help us to identify diabetes. We check your kidney functions, help us to identify kidney issues. We check your cholesterol and blood pressure that will help us to identify heart disease risk as well as um, hypertension. We check your liver function tests and that will help us to identify liver issues, particularly people who drink alcohol a bit more than they should. The liver functions will help them. And then also check your urine. So that's a key thing at age 40. Now, if you're in a relationship with a woman, you as the man in her life 
should also encourage your wife or your partner to have her own health checks. Because if a woman you're married to is age 30 and she has not had a cervical cancer screening mm -hmm. and sadly comes down with cervical cancer, that would destroy your family life if it's not identified on time. So ensuring that you know the screening program, not just for the man, but also for your partner is important. It's not just to wait for her to push you, you should also know what is that. So health check at age 40 is important. Between ages 60 and 69, bowel cancer screening is important. Sadly, both men died at 43, but well, for most people, bowel cancer is after age 60, and that's why the screening program starts from age 60. And then sexually transmitted infections, sometimes maybe you are, you've cooled down now, but five, 10 years ago, you are very hot with women, is what's doing, going to the gum clinic and having cervical, sorry, and secondary transplant infectious screening just to be sure that you don't have any any infections and then if you're diabetic the diabetic screening service the eye screening is there from age 12 actually for those who attack ones and for any other person whenever you're diagnosed with diabetes every year you have eye screening which is done for you and then for those of african descent there's tests for dads if your wife is pregnant I think there's a test for sickle cell or thalassemia, which is available, so you should be able to ask for it. So these are some of the tests that uh, are key for us to have. So beyond the health checks, the lifestyle issues have never changed. Mm. One is physical activity. I mean, I've done Couch to 5K. It's an excellent app. It takes you from your couch to running five kilometers in nine weeks it's an excellent program which is free to download on nhs couch to 5k so being the the more active you are the better it is so couch to 5k i've done it twice it's a very good app so being active has a massive effect it helps you to lose weight makes blood pressure improve and um, diabetes improve your self-esteem improve if you snore it gets it better so physical activity with weight loss is important the less your weight is the more you postpone many problems so weight loss physical activity eating the right foods i know it's easier said than done because they say knowledge is knowing the right thing to do mm. wisdom is doing it mm. Doctors commit suicide. Doctors have lung cancer as smokers. So knowledge alone is not enough because people have barriers. But when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. So your physical activity, improving the diet, having a better work-life balance, sleep is essential. For almost 25 years of my life, I slept for three to, three to four hours a day. You won't believe that. Despite all my knowledge, it was only five weeks ago I was given the matching order and now have six, seven hours of sleep. It's not an easy thing to do, but having work-life balance and sleeping well is important. Cutting back on alcohol. If you do smoke, stopping smoking is the best thing you can do for your health. I tell diabetics or people who have heart disease who smoke when they come to clinic, I said, everything I do for you as your doctor can never be compared to stopping smoking. Mm. I don't know how these chemicals of the body have an effect on us but every day when you look at yourself in the mirror you have two choices either to be happy or to be sad and if you find yourself being sad more than happy sadly you're more likely to become diabetic hypertensive have cancer sadly because the chemicals in our body even if you become hypertensive whether you're on one medicine or on two three four medicines depends on your approach to life. The angry, sad person is more likely to have poorer health than the person who is happy, clappy person. They have the same problem, but one has a better approach to life. Mm -hmm. So these are the lifestyle things that I would really recommend for everyone. If the less fat pad you have, the more active you are, honestly, the better it will be in every area of health. And if you realize that the man who who is very active, who does all the right things. Sometimes even if you do all the right things, you can still have a stroke. Mm. A man who is slim does everything right because his genes are for stroke. But what we realize is that he has a mild stroke. He comes out of, you look at, ben, what's his name? Michael Johnson had a stroke. Yes, was a well, exactly. But he's back doing all the what he does. 
And that shows that even if you do everything right, sometimes, rarely, you may still have those conditions. But how you re re recover from them, you realize that your excellent lifestyle makes you have a better recovery than somebody who has an awful lifestyle. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you so much. Someone has just said, please, can you talk about a bit about me? We are, mental health has a section of its own, right? There is no way we can have a, a, a talk show on men's health and we don't talk about mental health. We're going, actually, that's what we're going to, the, the next point. But I just want a doctor to clarify something for us. There is this conception about men having their laptops on their lap because it's called laptop. Is there okay. any, is there any um, medical, is there any implication, anything related to one having laptop on their lap and having issues with prostate cancer or something down there is there any link basically with um, laptops and men uh, having problems okay the, i think the the from my from my understanding the relationship is casual and not causal so um laptops as we know emit electromagnetic frequencies and that there is heat and there is radiation now nature has put the testicles away from the body in the scrotal sac because the best temperature for the for spermatogenesis for the manufacture of sperms it has a lower temperature than the body temperature mm -hmm. and that's why nature has put it that way so if you have a laptop and you on the laptop is actually on your lap and it's generating heat then it means that technically the heat depending on how much time it means that the manufacture of sperms can be adversely affected but it's a it's just a correlation because maybe instead of having 100 million sperms you have 95 million sperms we only need one sperm so really it will not cause infertility yes your neck and your back pain may burn the skin but in terms of actually stopping you from becoming fertile i think it's, it's unlikely but there's just a correlation not a causal relationship right Thank so you. but get a get a laptop mat get something that you can you know yes, a hard back seat but yes Thank you so much. So mm -hmm. now we're going to move on. I, I, it looks like many people are looking forward to listening or hearing mental health. So we're going to move straight to mental health. So as we all know, mental health is a massive problem. I, would, I don't know if I would say it's even more on the we from the black and the BAME community because the way most men are brought up or the way we were brought up, men are not meant to cry, men are not meant to express their emotion, men are not meant to do so many things that they should do to enable them release that emotion release the the whatever it is they are going to and recently just a few days ago a pastor murdered his wife and yesterday i was discussing with my husband i kept asking why would a man not just a man a pastor who people meet talk to for their issue get to the point where he murders his wife not at home but even took a step further to meet her at her workplace just to commit that crime. It, it can only be mental health problems. So, sir, mm. please, what is men or male mental health? And what are the signs that, because someone asked, what are the signs that women should be looking out for? What are the signs that men should be looking out for to know that, look, there is issue and I need to deal with it in terms of mental health? Yeah, I mean, like you said, it's something that we probably would need to come back to discuss. It's a, it's sad, but I want us to go back to. If I like to look at things from the from the holistic perspective, mm. we have four issues, as I've said this two or three times already: our genes, our lifestyle, the quality of health services where we live, and the environment we live in. These are the four key factors that affect our health and so much more in terms of mental health. If your parents were both depressed, you are more likely to be depressed. Mm. If you have a lifestyle of smoking, drinking, alcohol, poor sleep, no exercise, your lifestyle will make you probably have hypertension or diabetes or both. If a man, for example, has diabetes, I know a man who is in his 50s, who is very active, has lost his foot. That kind of man is going to be depressed. So physical problems, 
chronic long-term conditions have an impact on people's mental health. Then look at the environment we live in, the home we live in, the estate where we live in, the schools that our children go to, the streets we live in, the schools we our children go to, the skills that we have, whether we have skills for work or not, the kind of GP surgery we have, and how we perceive our perception of the kind of response we get when we call our doctors. What kind of parks? Where I live now, there are some woods I can take a walk. Some people, everything around them is concrete. The society, when you're walking on the streets, like look at the Black Lives Matter movement, the black man in America is more likely to be killed for just being black. So all these are things. Now, the key, one other thing is that there's something called income gap. The, the gap between the wealthy, the rich, and the poor. In every part of the world where there is a wide income gap, mental health problems are worse. In those countries where the gap between the rich and the poor is narrower, the mental health problems are less. Everywhere in the world, whether it's the North or South Hemisphere. So when you talk about mental health, it's not just a question of, we got to fix this man. It's a whole system problem. The other thing I want to mention is what is called adverse childhood experiences. What happens in the earliest years of a man's life would have a knock-on effect on their mental well-being. So where a man, as a child, his dad went to prison, or his dad was abusing his mother, or a parent died, or parents divorced, whether that child was abused, all those things have a massive effect on their, on their well-being. You know, whether you're able to get an, a short list there for an interview, if you go for an interview, even if you do very well, whether you get the job or not. I remember I went, I went for a job interview a few years back. I knew I was even more knowledgeable about health inequality than the person that was interviewing me. And at the end, I was told the job was going to be given to somebody who was coming from somewhere else. I said, is it because I'm black? So the point is that all these things I've mentioned and more have a massive effect on the mental well-being. But of course, I will not forget the strong beliefs, the, the attitudes, the stereotypes of masculinity that is a, a man should, men don't cry. You know, so the man even has barriers to seek help when he needs help. The problems of relationships with our parents, with our siblings, with our wife, sister or girlfriend, the father figure, you see whether we had a father figure or not. All these things are key to our mental well-being. The problems of debt, Many people are living larger than lives. They have massively in debt. All these things have an effect. So life happens to people. Last year, a year before I lost my brother, his wife, and my mom in one year. Mm. When people have such challenges, you know, you're in work, you're out of work, your marriage is good, it collapses, your wife has a child, divorce, job loss, all these things, how a man responds to it, all these things have a massive effect on a man. So to be able to address mental health, they look at a wide array of things that already have a problem and how well is society helping. And then the services we have are, are friendlier for women. Even the World Health Organization has noticed that a woman who comes in with antenatal care can do other things in the process. Most services are against men, as it were. And then men are into the riskier jobs, you know, in mining, in the physical jobs, women are more likely to be in less traumatic places of work. So all these things contribute, but above all is the expectation that the man has to be the boss in the house. I know, for example, that I, I, I house the boss. I always say that a man smiles, who knows that he is not the house. He bosses, he houses the boss, does not boss the house. <laughs> and any man you see smiling who is married probably knows that his wife is the boss. And that's the truth because most times women run the homes. Most women run the homes. Most, some of us maybe earn more money, but we know our wives run the homes. But some men want to show I'm the boss in the house, and there's conflict in the house. So it's actually, we need to take it bit by bit, look at it from a genetic, lifestyle, health service, and environmental point of view. But I wonder sometimes whether men are endangered species, actually, <laughs> when you look at mental health. I mean, they, well, you, you, know, you know that you, suicide is the single biggest cause of death in men under 50 years in the UK. Mm. 
So really, it's, it's, it's a massive thing. And when you look at all the other things, tobacco use, alcohol use, violence and road injuries, everything, you know, men are more likely to die way many years ahead of women and all that. So mental health contributes to a large extent to these problems. So what are the signs? What are the things that, like you said, the physical health, there are some things that you mentioned that are the symptoms or the signs that men should be looking out for and partners should be looking out for in their, their man. So what are the signs? What should we be looking out for? That when we see those things, as a wife, when I see those things my, in my husband, I know that, okay, this is something I need to need to work on. We just want to know the signs. Well, the first thing is communication. Mm. If, as a wife, and if your husband is normally a bubbly, happy person, you know, all those, I mean, it is different because they say generally women talk men don't talk but in some homes the man is a chatterbox so yes <laughs> in some homes the woman does all the talking but if you're in that home where your husband is the one that does all the talking and then suddenly you find him quiet that is something that is a, is a i think that's what you call early warning signs so like you said let's mention some of them one is communication if communication has changed two is finance there are some men that have always managed finances well. They may not have an, a lot of money, but as a wife, you know that they manage. But if you now realize that maybe if normally he, this is the kind of money that is available to you, but you now have to struggle to get that money, it might be that there are things that are happening which he's not talking about. So again, money is another thing. The third one is relationships. Sometimes, you know, we are human and then both of you just have a decide, you know, something happens. Maybe it could be his sister or his mother or something, you know. And then the next thing is sex. Some women, sadly, because they are not happy, the man is not doing what he's supposed to do. They starve him of sex. You know, that is an issue. Or if it's someone who's always harassing his wife for sex and suddenly can't be bothered, that is another issue. But there are some symptoms of anxiety and depression. If somebody, if you Google PHQ Papa Hello Queen hyphen nine, that's one. That will take you to PHQ nine. There's nine symptoms of that suggest depression, and the other is GAD seven, Gulf Alpha Delta seven. That's general anxiety depression seven. There are seven questions that suggest depression. So I would suggest every man have a look at those. Check if you have those symptoms. Every woman know those symptoms, and then you would know if you're the man in your life has those symptoms. So feeling down, low, depressed, which lasts for more than two weeks, poor concentration, increasing fear or worries. If you ever hear a man say, oh, I'm tired, I'm tired, or is either sleeping too much or tossing and turning all night, is either eating too much or not eating at all, reduce libido. They may not mention to you, but somehow, if you know he's always wanting to make love and suddenly he's not asked for it for two weeks or a month, that's a warning sign that maybe something is going on. Your husband may be a, a person who gets angry once a month or once in two months, but now he gets angry every week. Almost anything you say, he snaps. That again suggests. So anger, irritability. You now find that he doesn't even answer his phone when he rings. Isolation. So phone is ringing, likes to watch football, football is in his back, he's not carrying the remote. Those are against warning signs. So just keeping to himself. If he's all over the children, if you have children, he's just minding his business and all of that. All these are things to suggest that something is going on. I mean, I, people are different. I don't want to use my experience, but my experience is that, which is, which may, I don't want to make it look like it's, what do you call it? Uh, I'm not sure the word to use now, but uh, I have to talk from my experience, which could be very different from your experience. But my experience is traditional. It's like a man stops, his mother stops murdering him <clears throat> and passes the button of motherhood to his wife. Now, for many men, that's what it is. They go from one mother to another mother. And I always say, again, I may be wrong, that problems happen in homes 
when a good woman stops trying to make it right at home. You know, so when you have these symptoms in your mind, you need to find energy somewhere to encourage him. Because that's the last time he needs you in his ears telling him he's failing his duties. A man, I think the, the worst thing a man could experience is that of feeling disrespected by his wife. A man wants his wife to respect him even when he's at his lowest. Mm. You know, a, like you say, a woman wants security. A man wants to be respected. Treat him as your king even when you know he's failing. Tell him it can be tomorrow will be better. The sun never stops shining. Even this will pass. Such words of support honestly will raise your mind from the ashes. He will go from grass to grace. And that's where I think a good woman makes the difference. Just use words to let him know. But of course, when you feel this is happening, he needs help. And if you will not be able to provide that help, let him look for ways to get help. If it's in Leeds, Leeds Mental Wellbeing Service is an excellent website that would send post people to all the services around mental health that they can get in the city. They all join together and that's one place that they can find support. Oh, wow. I'm just trying to write down the uh, everything that doctor has mentioned, like the the website. I'm going to link it up on the description section of this video, so you can help yourself. Mental health issue is a massive one. We don't have to just keep quiet about it because I feel like it's actually taking our men more than the physical issue. I think it's because it's not something that shows on our face like the physical um um uh, health. So it's just hidden people don't talk about it people are quiet so sir what would you say to i would let's let me talk from a woman's perspective how would you encourage a woman that clearly knows that her man is going to a uh, breakdown like mental health problem and he doesn't want to talk about it he's he's just shut down he doesn't want to talk about it how can this woman support this man Okay, I mean, the, one of the things is um, what kind of social networks do they have already? And COVID-19 is not a great time. Mm. Social network is really important. I mean, like in Leeds, we have uh, what we call kinsmen, a group of about 30 men who come together once in three months or so, and they talk about every, they solve all the problems of the world in one night. And that kind of social network is something that is important. Um, sometimes it's difficult to get men. It's as if they now feel you're nagging them. Mm. But one thing I know from a personal experience, and like they say, I know I've just been lucky because I've been supported by my partner. Otherwise, I've had issues in my life in the last few years. That when I look at some of my patients, and I see the problems that they have. And I just said, if I open my mouth and tell you my problems, you wouldn't believe. Mm. But because there's a supportive woman, you know, you come home and there is food to eat, even though you've not given money for food. You don't, you don't, you don't hear somebody saying, what, where, where, do, where do you want me to get the money to put food on the table for you? There is food for you to eat. So you need to sort of encourage them without nagging them. They need help. And how you will be in a good position to do one way to get help is to see the GP. Or before you see the GP, they, there are some online tools. Honestly, everything is online. And I was looking at it as online debt services. Citizens Advice website yeah, is yeah. fantastic. Christians Against Poverty is an excellent website. So there are quite a few things online. So you can find something simple on one page for him to look at. I encourage him to go and see his GP because some of these problems may be physical. Might be that your husband is diabetic or the man has become diabetic and he feels tired all the time. He doesn't know that. So even if you say, why not go and have a, a, your, your health check? You've not had one last eight years. Encouraging, I'll go with you. I'll book the appointment for you and I'll go with you. That's the kind of way you could help him. Um, sometimes, it's, what's his favorite dish? You know, sometimes... Your husband likes to watch football. When, when it's football time, you walk away. Maybe that's an opportunity to say, your team, team A is playing. Why don't we come and watch it together? 
And he'll be surprised because you always nag when it's football time. Mm. So find out what he enjoys to do, which he's not doing, and encourage him to be part of that. So seek support. There's a lot of online services. You search them and then encourage him to look at it. If the money, a lot of times, is a financial thing, find out because your husband may be paying school fees for your in-laws you don't know about and he's struggling. So honestly, find out what his financial challenges are and let him know that however dark the clouds are, the sun never stops shining. Mm. It, can, it can only get better. But come on his side and this is not a time to point fingers at him because you want him to come out of the dump where he is. So support him, signpost him, do the best way you can help him is to do what you do normally for him. Don't stop doing it because he's not doing his own bit. Do what you can do, but help him to take responsibility and not you doing what he needs to do. Help him to take responsibility. And it's a marathon as long as you can make one step. So working groups, dance groups, arts group, everything is online now via Zoom or whatever. Help him, but hopefully, as long as you're able to communicate with him, slowly but surely you'll get there but don't give up on him wow <laughs> maybe he didn't listen he didn't listen to you that's why he's in this mess not a time to tell him i told you <laughs> <laughs> somebody said a doctor's also motivational speakers yes <laughs> so, so, sometimes <laughs> <laughs> but when, it, when it comes to mental health right, i think because it's something that involves mostly communication so you have mm. to you have to talk so there's another question I've got here. What are the things women do, like there are contributing factors to poor mental health in men? We want to know that. I know most women are watching and most of them are going to come and watch later. What are the things mm. that we do that contributes to men having poor mental health? Well, okay. Um, let's start with um, money. Sometimes... In some homes, women have unrealistic expectations mm. of um, of what a man. Okay, I'm going to say this is very personal, but I'll just say it as an example. My family has been nagging me to get a new car, and I have the money to deposit for a brand new car. But I've not had a car for the last two months. I've been using my wife's car with her. And they have been nagging me. And I've just refused to go ahead and buy the car. Because I know it's not just paying the deposit. And I have to pay the monthly payments. Mm. But I've got a daughter who is going into university at the end of this month. And her sister who is from the university has not started work. So I now realize I have to be taking care of two young women. In addition, which is something new. And I'm not ready to now have this additional expenditure. And I just said, why don't I just buy, instead of paying a deposit, just use that money and buy what car that money can buy. So I don't have to worry about paying monthly. Mm -hmm. But they can't, they can't see that. Because I'm looking at my status and they feel that you work so hard, you deserve a better car. But I know that if I get the better car I deserve, the trouble of the additional expenditure will be on my head. Now, that's the kind of thing that a woman may not understand. Because she wants the best for her man, but it comes at a price. So I'm not using a personal example that sometimes they are saying this, you're saying this in, in the man's best interest, but he is looking at what that would mean mm. in six months, a year's time. You are looking at the time now. Now, so sometimes it's a financial decision that makes the problems. It could be something that happened in the past, and now the repercussion comes, it falls on him if he's a higher breadwinner. So that's one. Next one is communication. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. The family that prays together stays together. Many times, communication breakdown is an early warning sign. And in the home where the woman talks more, in my home, I talk more than my wife, or funny enough, but in the home where the woman talks more than the man, if she stops talking, communication breaks down. Arguments are another issue. So when you ignore the man who has become quiet, who is withdrawn, you now withdraw to your side of the house, the early warning signs will now get worse. Mm. And I said sex is another thing. Do not use, do not starve your man of sex because he has upset you. That is not a right thing to do. And then sometimes, again, women 
because they run the home, they get preoccupied with the children, forgetting that the first child in the house is mm. your husband. Sorry to say that. So do not ignore the first child in the house for the other children in the house. You know, so that's another thing that sometimes women get preoccupied with running the home, forgetting that your man needs you, that he needs you to continue to be his mother and let's not be distracted by. Of course, if the man is busy, is active, is confident, things are going well for him, it doesn't matter. But when the early warning signs appear that your husband is going down the slippery road, that's the time for you to now murder him a bit more support him a bit more, become a motivational speaker mm. genuinely in the house, and then use those words of encouragement to let him know that we are for better, for worse, and with you all the way. Wow. Thank you so much. I'm just taking notes because this, this is a topic that I think it affects everybody. I always say to myself that 98% of people you see out there have one mental health issue or the other. It's, it's, I don't think there's anyone that is all free. If you don't have mental, you have physical. If you don't have physical, you have another one. So everyone has one thing or the other that they are going through. So I just want to encourage um, women, from coming from a woman's perspective, that we should learn to support our husbands, our spouses, our partners. One of the things that doctor said now that, that just struck me so hard is that even at his lowest, even at that point where... We think that, okay, he's, he's done something wrong. We know he's done something wrong, but we also know that we need to protect his mental health. So even at his lowest, don't stop being a good wife. Even at his lowest, don't stop doing that thing that he's supposed to do. Even if he has offended you, be, I wouldn't say be the bigger person, but be a good wife. Do it because he not because he deserves it, but because he needs it. That's just an encouragement. And I just pray that women would start supporting their spouses better. Start um, knowing that it's also in their hands to help their, me their, their man or their men with their mental health issue, as well as they are helping us with our own mental health issue. Honestly, sir, I think we have to come back because I've not even gone half of my questions. But I want us to end somewhere. But before that, I just want to and introduce the next talk show um i and doctor we're going to talk about the next time it's going to come hopefully i pray is as soon as possible so we can just carry on and finish it but the next talk show if doctor doesn't come this coming weekend is going to be on women what do women really want we'll have an amazing woman coming to talk to us about it and she's going to be answering questions like are women really complicated the emotions that women dish out what does it really really mean so i would encourage all men to come and hear so when you see the attitude in your wife you know that she's not doing it because of this there's another reason why she's doing it so she's coming to talk about it and is in two weeks because our shows are going to be in two weekly so it's going to be in two weeks but let's hope that doctor comes back fingers crossed next weekend <laughs> next weekend to finish <laughs> this topic as, so that we can just, you know, so we we'll continue in that spirit so we don't quench the spirit. I pray so. I'm hoping. But you're going to find out if it's coming or not. So, sir, in, 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 in summary, we're just going to touch on support and recommendation and a little bit of lifestyle. What would you advise men to do? Because I was talking to a colleague some time ago and she said to me that women need to start helping men in terms of booking like days out, massage, spa for their men because men don't do these things. If, they are, if that's going to be a support, a way to support their mental health, that women should be doing this. And women should also be going out like I could just go out with my kids for like three days, four days, just leave my husband alone in the house to be himself. And But sometimes I also find that, that even when I go, he's calling me because he misses me. So I don't know if I should actually do that or I should just do what works for me. So what would you advise men? How can they have a better lifestyle to be able to have a better well-being? In, in just in summary. Right. Um, the... The first thing I would say 
from the home point of view is that for the married man, from my experience, I that's something that I've not talked about, but I live after work is community work. So for many years, I've not had time for myself or my family, really, because it's just been work, work, work. I've learned to do something that every week I told myself on one day of the week, even if for just one hour or two hours, everything stops and I sit next to my wife. So that's one thing I want to recommend to every one of us. Find the time one hour a week and let that be unless the world is coming to an end, there's an earthquake, just be with your partner. And even if you do nothing else but just put the telly off if you have to, but just spend time. If you can talk to each other for one hour a week, that's a starting point. If you can take a walk together one hour a week, just the two of you, it's just, I say, fake it until you make it. Just start something, just you, nothing else, not technology, just heart to heart, voice to voice. I think that's something that you don't have to spend money on. Mm. Sit down in the house or do um, YouTube aerobics, do something silly together one hour a week, which is something different. Then the next thing is for a man is a lifestyle thing is important. If you've not had a health check, have a health check. Check your blood pressure. Get physical. Do those things about lifestyle. If you do drink, say, I'm going to cut it back by 50%. If you sleep for one hour, honestly, I sleep for seven hours now. It's a different lifestyle. So do your best to make those changes because you are destroying your body by slow degrees. Mm. Try and do those lifestyle changes. When you don't sleep well, you're sleep deprived. You are snapping your decision making at work, at home. So those are the kind of things that I think we should try and make some little changes. Spend some little time with the wife. If you have teenage children or adult children, spend some, even once a month, give one hour to your daughter or your son and have a one hour together. You know, the other thing is that you must have a network. Mm. Even Honestly, if you don't have a network, you will die soon. If you have a network, it could be a network of old, I mean, I have network of secondary school, network of medical school, network of Nigerians in Leeds, network of Nigerian men. I have, honestly, I have to, so many networks. I think it's good to have networks. So that even if it's once a month or once in three months, have a laugh with your old friends. It helps your health. And then if you have any medical conditions, read about your medical. There's so much information. You don't even need doctors. You can go, if you're diabetic, you can go to um, diabetes.co.uk, diabetes.org.uk. There are so many patient groups. You can have every information on any health condition that you have. Become an expert patient. Don't depend on your GPs to tell you how to live your life. You are the expert of your diabetes. You are the expert of your hypertension. So become a boss. Go to the right website and have the knowledge. My people perish for lack of knowledge. So be well informed about your condition. And then in your place of work, that's where the bills get paid. Mm. Do your best at work. Do your best at work. So your workplace, first your family comes first. If you die, your office will forget you after one week. Your family will suffer for life. So family comes first. Your wife, your children first before anything else. And then do your work well because that's where the bills get paid. If you do your work well, you get, um, you get followed, you get sacked. At least you know you've done your work well. So family work and then know that even this shall pass. Mm. Whatever life throws at you, life happens. It is not where you stand when things are good, but to rise each time you fall. And that's why it's important that if you are down, you will rise up one day. Amen. You're not going to be down forever. But the truth is, look at your life from a physical, economic, social, cultural, spiritual point of view and try and tick every box of your life. Mm -hmm. Even if you have 10%, try and get 10% all around. Be a rounded person. Mm -hmm. Don't just be all physically... I'm good, but mentally I'm at zero. No, try and tick every box and try and get a C in every box or a B in every box. Don't be a triple jumper who has a very fantastic hop and very little step. You know, try and have a balanced life. And the truth is that if the clouds are heavy, one day they'll break. Mm. And the sun, you'll realize, never stops shining. Mm. Oh, God. 
Wow, honestly. <laughs> thank you so, so much for words of encouragement. The, the, what you've dished out is amazing. Guys, on the comment section, I just want you to say one thing. Thank you, Dr. Hector Goma. That's all I wanted to say. Because <laughs> the things that he has said, I have to go back and watch this video with my pen and notes and write and write. Because one of the things I've observed is that most of our men that move from um, Africa to this country, they don't really have that network. Like doctor said, they don't have that network. They don't socialize. They don't... It's not as if they don't. They don't want to do it, but they just don't have that time it's all about work maybe church work church what that's it's just a vicious circle no social life nothing is going on one of the things that i do just to encourage you guys that are listening is that i try as much as i can because i am a busy person as well my husband is working as well we try as much as i can i proactively decided that every school holiday every half term even if it's a night, I have to book somewhere we go out for the night. It's something I've been doing. And whenever I don't do it, even if he doesn't say, oh, we've not done it, I know that he needs it. It's just that time, like doctor said, one hour a month or one hour a week. And it helps. By the time we come back, we've talked. we talk talked so much that the things we've not spoken for a year, we probably have covered everything in just one night of going out. So women book something for your guys they may not book it but book it they will even pay because i book it and at the end of the day he pays for <laughs> it you know so book it and they would enjoy every minute of it spas massage whatever you need to do do it please say thank you on the comment section and hopefully doctor is going to come back god please Help doctor to come back as soon as possible. <laughs> and honestly, guys, thank you so much for uh, spending time with us. I hope that you've learned. I know that you've learned something. I know that you've learned something. And you're going to share it to other people as well. We're going to come back very soon. And we're going to cover every other section. Because I've got like almost 10 questions I haven't touched. We need to cover them as well. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Sir. I don't know what to say, but all I can say is that God bless you and bless yes, your sir. family and bless all that concerns you. If you live in Leeds and you're not in contact with Dr. Hector Goma, I don't know what you're doing because <laughs> we've been in Leeds and he's been a blessing to everyone around him. So please contact him. He's got that network and I guess he might want to introduce you to the network he's got as well. So thank you so much for being with us. I need to stop talking now. And we will see you very, very soon. Take care then. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Whew. That was amazing. Uh, thank you.